Nicholas Bewart died on 11th July 2017 at the ripe age of 77. He was mourned by many people, among them the then President of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta. He said, Bewart was a true patriot. When the history of this country is written, it will include many men and women in this country who quietly but firmly and confidently are responsible for what Kenya is today. A sound country, a stable country with a growing economy. And Nicholas Bewart is one of those people. The then Deputy President William Ruto eulogized him also as follows. Nicholas Bewart was forthright. He was very loyal. He was very dependable. He did whatever he did with determination, passion, and excellence. He was a minister in several ministries. If you go to those ministries, you will find his footprints there. Nicholas was a successful person. He worked very hard. He was not petty. His eulogy also stated that his source of wealth was explained to be from his humble beginnings. As a teenager, in the late 1950s, Biwot worked alongside his father, who had established a successful fruit and vegetable business in Eldoret. The young Biwot also borrowed small amounts of money from a local bank with which he expanded his own business, selling meat products and eggs. Nicholas Biwot continued to expand his own businesses and in the 1960s, formed ABC Foods Processing and Animal Feed Products. That is how his empire grew from the humble beginnings to the multi-billion status that he established. From construction companies to aviation companies, oil companies to electricity producing companies, from banks to industries, extensive farms and ranches, lots of property, both in Kenya and abroad. Here is a list of businesses and property owned by Biot. But, but hold on. If we are to list all the businesses and properties, we could be here for a long time. I will play this extensive list at the end of this video. It is hard to argue with the fact that Biwot was a good man, a hard working man, a man blessed with an entrepreneurial mind, nonetheless a man. So why could he be the subject in a financial crimes podcast? It is because of the simple answer that he was a man and men have weaknesses. And maybe Bewalt's weakness was how he made some of his money. Because I don't think selling meat products and eggs has made anyone a billionaire yet. Bewalt is a man who loved his reputation. I mean, anyone who dared mention his name in the same line with a scandal awaited defamation charges at the court. In March 2002, Biwot was awarded 20 million shillings by the publisher of the People Dairy in compensatory and exemplary damages following the publication of an article implicating him in unheard dealings involving the award of tenders for the construction of the Tuckwell Gorge hydroelectric power project. Book point would also bear the blunt. They paid him 7 million shillings for selling the book Dr. Ian West's case book. The British journalist Chester Stern, which alleged that he, Biwot, killed the Foreign Affairs Minister Robert Ouko in 1990. The journalists and the publishing house were asked to pay Biwot damages of 30 million shillings. Having said that, I wouldn't want to find myself next in the defamatory line for the story I'm about to tell you. But 
I will quote a well-publicized but never acknowledged report by Kroll. The report laid bare all the cards that we would played. He was a good man. But in harsh tones, I will tell you the other side of the total man. The biography of wealth from power in politics. The hand of the king. I am Jeff Kafka. The scandalous life of Nicholas Bewart, corruption and wealth, starts in 1976 with the arrival of Gadzevi. Gadzevi is an Israeli national who was exiled from the neighboring Uganda. Gadzevi, remember that name? And that face. It will shape the man whom we all came to revere and dread at the same measure. But first, a brief history. Nicholas Bewart was born in February 27, 1940, in Keio District, Rift Valley, Kenya. He was educated at the Capsabate High School. He attended the University of Melbourne, Australia from 1962 to 1964. He earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Economics and Political Science, as well as a Diploma in Public Administration. Not many of us knew that he was such a learned fellow. He was also a chain smoker, a habit he picked from his peers. Just about five foot five inches tall and lean, he lacked the athletic body that the collagens normally have. But what he lacked in athleticism, he made up for it with leadership. He was a student leader at Capsabate High School. His face was a mixture of sophistication and simplicity. It portrayed raw innocence of a village boy, but his eyes shone with ambition beyond what his shoulders could bear. Biwot then served as a district officer in Nkubu in South Menti, Meru district from 1964 to 1965. He then returned to the University of Melbourne in 1966 to study for a master's degree in economics under a Commonwealth scholarship. He would eventually return to Kenya with an Australian Jewish wife, Honey Biwot. Perhaps him being married to a Jew would be what endeared him to the Israelis that he'd meet. Having completed his master's degree in Australia in 1968, Nicholas Bewart returned to the public service in the Ministry of Agriculture in 1971. In late 1972, Nicholas Bewart transferred to the Ministry of Home Affairs on the personal recommendation of President Kenyatta to work with his vice president and the then Minister for Home Affairs Daniel Arab Moy. And that, my friends, is where the bromance between the two would start, lasting each their lifetime. In 1974, Biwot stood as a candidate for the Keio South constituency in the general elections of that year, but he lost. Biwot was recalled to the Ministry of Home Affairs and a secretary to Minister Daniel Arab Moy. Kenya's vice president. The meeting between Moy and Biwot would form a lasting bond. First, there were Kalenjins trying to maneuver a Kikuyu dominated government of the late Mzee Kenyatta. Second, Biwot had the brains to steer the friendship past the Kenyatta era to and through the Moy era. In August 1978, the founding president would die. This left the presidency to his vice president, Moy. Biwot was promoted to deputy permanent secretary in the office of the president. Now that Moy was king, he needed a hand. 
And who better to assume the role of the hand of the king than be what? If you have never watched the epic screenplay, Game of Thrones, I will tell you now that the second most powerful person in a kingdom was known as the hand of the king. Though some hands have had the reputation of ruling their kings, Bewot knew his place. To Moi, he was a shield, a stalwart, and a strong right-hand man. In words of admirers, they said of the moi Bewot relationship that what the king dreams, the hand builds. But the critics would say otherwise. The king eats, and the heart takes a shit. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let's go back to the 70s when the two men met and started working together. Bewalt was in his early 30s. The world was his to conquer. Nairobi was starting to blossom. Nightlife was rife. Perhaps these are the joints that Bewalt would frequent. Moi was in his mid-forties, already a father of eight, but country responsibilities were weighing him down. Either that, or he envied the free life that Bewot seemed to enjoy because in 1974, he called it quits with his wife of over 20 years, Lena Moy. Something else was happening in 1974. A historic event was taking place in the neighboring Uganda. On June 1974, an Air France Airbus A300 jet airliner with 248 passengers had been hijacked by two members of a Palestinian terrorist group. The flight, which had originated in Tel Aviv with the destination of Paris, was diverted after a stopover in Athens via Benghazi to Entebbe, the main airport in Uganda. The Ugandan government supported the hijackers, and dictator Idi Amin, who had been informed of the hijacking from the beginning, personally welcomed the terrorists. After moving all hostages from the aircraft to a disused airport building, the hijackers separated all Israeli and several non-Israeli Jews from the larger group and forced them into a separate room. Over the following two days, 148 non-Israeli hostages were released and flown to Paris. 94 Israeli passengers along with 12 member Air France crew remained hostages and were threatened with death. 100 Israeli commandos came for the rescue mission. The operation, which took a week of planning, lasted 90 minutes. Of the 106 remaining hostages, one or two were rescued and three were killed. All the hijackers and 45 Ugandan soldiers were killed. Kenyan forces supported Israel. And in the aftermath of the operation, Id Amin, issued orders to retaliate and kill Kenyans present in Uganda. As a result, 245 Kenyans in Uganda were killed and 3,000 fled the country. Now you're wondering, what does this scene out of an action movie have anything to do with Nicholas Biwas? Pay attention. The year is 1974. Bewot and Moy are in a bromance. Moy was the vice president and minister for home affairs. Bewot was his assistant. In Uganda, Israel commandos have pulled an action field rescue mission and Idi Amin is angry. So he expels the Kenyans and Israelis living in Uganda. 
And who do you think was among the Israeli delegation arriving in Kenya in 1974? A business magnate named Gad Zevi and his associates. Remember, I told you to remember that name and that face. Gad Zevi. He was in the construction business, a shrewd businessman and an opportunist. Gad Zevi was quick to introduce himself to the hierarchies in Kenya. Who better than the Minister for Home Affairs? He met with the then Vice President and by extension, Moise Broman's partner, Biwot. Gad Zevi and Biwot became close. They were age mates two 35-year-olds trying to find a place on the table. And a place on the table they found. Gad also came with his business associates. Among them, Akbal Ismail, a lawyer, and Al-Nul Kassam, a banker. Before them, neither Moe nor Biwot had the business acumen or muscle to be like the Kenyatas before him. Gad Zevi would introduce Biwot and Moy to the construction business. In November of 1975, a company known as Lima Limited was incorporated. The shareholders, Moy, Biwot, and one of the Israelis. The sole intention of this company was to take advantage of government tenders. And so, the two started making small money here and there. Then, in 1978, Gad Zevi was registered as a civil engineer in Kenya, and later that year, another company, HZ Construction and Engineering, was created by Zevi. The shareholders, Biwot, Oi, and Zevi. In 1979, Biwot was elected member of parliament for Kenya South. Biwot returned to the office of the president, but now, was promoted as Minister of State. On the side, HZ Construction and Engineering, the company that was credited for many construction projects in Kenya, became prominent. Of course, it was the owners who laughed all the way to the bank. But all this was in preparation of a major project that was coming. Projects that would catapult Bewalt into billionaire status in his early 40s. Bewalt used Gadzevi's counsel, and this was it. Because Bewalt and Moy were going to make so much money, the normal banking system would not be able to handle it. Solution? Acquire your own bank. Moy and Biwot went on to own at least four banks, at least according to my research. In the next episode, we shall reveal the banks that Biwot and Moy owned and used to loan the money. But in the meantime, here is a list of what Biwot owns. Nicholas Biwot remained a controversial figure in Kenyan politics until his death in July 11, 2017. Despite the numerous allegations against him, he was never convicted of corruption. Biwot's legacy continues to be a subject of debate 
with some viewing him as a symbol of corruption and others as a shrewd politician who played a pivotal role in Kenyan politics. Some have described him as a mysterious man, a paranoid man who never owned a mobile phone or used the same car twice. And even in the end, he exited with the same elegance and paranoia that he had lived with, a gold-plated bulletproof coffin. This is part two of the story of Nicholas B. Watt. Here is a list of the banks that they owned. In 1981, Biwot purchased the Middle East Bank using Akba Ismail as a nominee, Stevie's lawyer. Another Israeli, Al Nul Kassam, had started his own bank, Trade Bank, but his silent shareholders were Moy and Biwot. Then entered the Pan African Bank whose directors were a Pakistan national known as Mohammed Aslam and Hedam. Hedam. Ah, initials for His Excellency Daniel Arab Moy. Who would have thought? And the fourth bank, you won't even believe it, Biwot and President Moy were joint owners of Bank Belgais in Belgium. There is a bank in Belgium owned by two Kenyans. In September 1983, Nicholas Bewalt was made the Minister of Energy and Regional Development by President Moy. Shortly, you will see why this was a genius move that was the final puzzle in the jigsaw in the preparation for the unpresented riches. As the Minister for Energy, Biwot initiated the process of construction of mega hydro power generating projects. Tuckwell Gorge Hydroelectric Dam Project. Its construction would begin in 1986. Biwot arranged for Zivi to get the contract through the company they had just created, HZ Construction and Engineering. The original costs of the contract was between 70 and 80 US million dollars, although it was inflated to about 270 US million dollars. A whole 200 million dollars profit for Biwot, Moy, and Zivi, all in the 1980s. Trade Bank had a forex trade department where it operated foreign accounts and foreign currency accounts. At the heart of the department was Solomon Mudamia, a young Meru man who was 26, uh, turning 27, when he and Biwot met. Biwot, Drew Al Nul Kassam, the owner of Trade Bank, asked the young man, Solomon, to dedicate his entire time moving the money from Kenya to foreign bank accounts in the name of forex trading. At first, Solomon did not know that the billions he was going to handle from 1986 to around 1991 were the illegal proceeds from the Tuckwell Dam project. But with time, he learned that the money was dirty, so dirty that even the world or Anul Kassam had no idea as to how much money was being delivered to Solomon in briefcases every day at Trade Bank. Solomon Bodamia simultaneously opened personal accounts with the same foreign bank, facilitating the transfer of funds for his own use. It is estimated that he skimmed off close to 100 million Kenya shillings while he was still at 27. This was the first major scandal that rocked Kenya in the late 80s. It was such a huge payday that three key things happened. One, Solomon Mudamia was able to skim close to $1 million and started his own bank in 1993, Eurobank. Two, 
Gadzivi was able to acquire a full refinery from Chevron for $100 million in 1987. Caribbean Petroleum Refining, which operates gas stations and refineries in Puerto Rico. And three, Biwot had a loan of over 400 million shillings from Trade Bank. Biwot used this money to construct the Yaya Center. The loan was never repaid, leading to the collapse of Trade Bank and the fleeing of the country by Al Nul Qasam. Fun fact: In 2017, another script that would have dwarfed the Tarquel scandal was written. It was for the construction of the Arol and Kimwarel dams. Same venue, Kerio Valley, same financing model. It was to be financed using commercial loans, a very convenient purpose-built vehicle for kickbacks. Only this time, the culprits were caught before the scheme was executed. As the Minister for Energy, Biwot was instrumental in establishing the National Oil Camp Corporation. The building of national oil storage facilities near Nairobi and connecting them to the Mombasa refinery and extending the pipeline from Nairobi to Kisumu and Eldoret. The National Oil Corporation was banking with one of his banks, Pan African Bank. The profit from the Tarquel Gorge project and other projects was used to purchase Ken Oil. And when Mobile East operating King Kenya, Moy and Biwot acquired the assets and created Kobil. They operated hundreds of fueling stations in Kenya and in Uganda. As Kobil would later merge with Kennel to make Kennel Kobil, the two had minor minority stake but worth billions of shillings. Today, it is known as the Rubies Group. The proceeds of corruption allowed Biwa to amass a lot of assets and other companies that if counted one by one, we would maybe need a day or two to go through them. The sectors among which Biwot had huge interest include energy, our tourism, our mining, real estate, telecommunications, air transport, construction, and agriculture. And did we mention the 10,000 acres ranch in Australia? The 1990s were difficult in Kenya and particularly difficult for Biwot. The 90s had Ouko murdered and Biwot was implicated. The 90s had the Golden Bug scandal and Biwot was implicated. The 90s had the first multi party elections in Kenya. They also had the tribal clashes. Biwot, again, was implicated. This was through Biwot's association with Sajad and Bawazil, as the Kroll report revealed. Bawazil is an old coastal tycoon who owned a sugar company. And according to confidential sources, Bawazil and Sajad fi financed the ethnic clashes of 1992. Sajad was a very significant individual for Kano at the coast. So, Biwot had thrived in the 80s by using the three established rules for making money quickly. One, get a bank or banks. Two, get a money launderer. And three, give contracts to crooks and get hefty kickbacks. One of the mega projects had already paid dividends in the 80s, the Tarquel Gorge Hydroelectric Dam. Other projects included the Sondo Mirio Dam, 
the completions of the Masinga Multipurpose Dam and the Kiambere Hydroelectric Dam. But what I did not tell you is that there was another project that was expected to reap even higher benefits. In 1987, President Moy announced that the Kisumu Molasses plant would be revived. Robert Ohuko, as Minister for Industry and the plant being in his Kisumu constituency, was put in charge of the project. The rehabilitation of the molasses plant would bring much needed employment and development in the Kisumu area. Robert Ohuko would outsource a company known as BAK International to undertake the rehabilitation process. BAK International was a financial and funding consortium company based in Switzerland. The directors were Marianne Brina Matan, a Swiss-Italian woman, and Domenico Airaghi, an Italian. Marianne Brina Matan. Remember that name and that face. In 1990, Ohuko had been changed from the Ministry for Industry to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Ohuko was a flamboyant Luo thinker, an elite among the Moist ministers. But unlike other politicians, he was as straight as a narrow. But being straight in a crooked government was his undoing. The molasses plant and the cement factory had a total value of approximately 300 US million dollars. The usual suspects were pushing for the revival of the Kisumu molasses plant with the aim of getting hefty kickbacks. The problem was Ouko. Ouko was standing on their way. Hold that thought fast. Let me connect you to the political happenings at the time. Understand, by 1990, Kenya had been under the rule of Moi for 12 years. One party, rampant corruption, dwindling economic fortunes. There was constant and increasing pressure by the international community towards the government. Hoping to appear nice in the eyes of the world prefects, the USA, President Moy asked his foreign affairs minister, Robert Ohuko, to organize a private meeting with President George Bush in Washington. Ohuko did that, organized a private breakfast meeting with Moy and a delegation about 80 government officials, Moy, Ohuko, Biwot, and others. This was the infamous Washington trip. It did not resolve anything with the international community. Instead, it led to the very infamous execution of the Foreign Affairs Minister, Robert Ohuko. The Washington meeting was on 27th January 1990. The delegation returned to Kenya on 4th February 1990. And nine days later, the 10th of February, Oko was found murdered in his Koru farm, shot, mutilated, and burnt. After investigations, Biwot was named as a person of interest by Scotland Yard detective John Troon. In November 1991, Biwot was arrested and detained for two weeks. Later, he was released and relieved of his ministerial duties as the Minister for Energy. So for the next seven years, Biwot would remain in the political cold, but he was still the hand of the king, calling shots and doing his businesses privately. Let's go back a little. Do you remember Madame Marian Brain, the Swiss Italian who was helping Kenya revitalize the Kisumu molasses plant? 
Ms. Marianne was the main witness that led detectives to believe that Robert Ooko was murdered by Biwot. Now, I don't claim those to be facts and I don't claim to know what happened, but I will tell you her story or stories in this case. This story could be true, but could also be fiction. Her testimony is to be found in Trun's evidence and also in her London declaration during the Gorsungu Commission of Inquiry of March 2003. Miss Marian wrote a book, A Shining Star in Darkness. She told the story of the state of corruption in Kenya under President Moy, both as an observer and as a participant. In her account, she even had a romantic affair with Moy. She was Moy's girlfriend. She was born in 1941. Started working as a air hostess when she was 20. Blonde and beautiful, with blue shining eyes. She carried a charm that would lure men to her, an irresistible aura that aligned everything good to her path. Later, while in her 40s, she traveled to Kenya and fell in love with the country. She decided to settle in Kenya with her daughter in the late 1970s. It is not clear when and how she met Moy, but she confirmed that her romantic relationship with Moy was from 1979 to around 1982. In her book, she confirmed that she got favors, including her being a director of Back International, the company that was supposed to revive the Kisumu Molasses plan. She wrote about all the adventures she had in Kenya, how the people had loved her, how she had made many friends here, State House, at Cabernet Gardens, at the home, at the coast, at the game parks where they traveled. She was the woman whose presence had changed Moy. She had brought happiness into his life. With her, he had again looked like a young man, a man being in love for the first time, especially since he had been divorced for about six years. They had seen him invent the habit to wear a red rose in his buttonhole whenever they were attending functions together, smiling at each other, sharing their secret, and how he had insisted to wear a pale yellow rose whenever she was not there with him. For her, Moy had started to take more care about himself. He now also wore tailor-made elegant silk suits and beautiful ties, which she brought from Switzerland. Her daughter loved to eat strawberries. Moi had arranged that they were brought in by plane from Israel whenever they could not be found in Kenya. That was also the time when Moi started organizing barbecue parties, grilling meat on the roast, even supervising it himself. The little girl loved to eat with her fingers, saying that she wants to become like Moi, a true Africa. Then, too much politics and interference from Moy's men pushed her away. She returned to her native Switzerland, but still continued speaking with Moy. She would return to Kenya in 1986 to work on the Molasses project. But years later, after Oko was killed, she'd leave Kenya for good. The second story about her is a short one. Marian Brenner Martin, the Swiss Italian woman, is the same Marian Brenner who in 2007 alleged Jeff Quinange, then working for CNN, had assaulted and raped her. She cost Jeff his job at CNN. In my opinion, I think Marian is more of a high-profile con woman who would bed any great man for financial gains and then ensure his downfall. She is not the savior of Kenya as she would want us to believe in her book. 
Fear women. Biwot was at a pay for 28 years, from 1979 to 2007. During that time, he held various posts in government and was often referred to as the total man and Moy's fiercest defender, most loyal compatriot and most dependable compatriot, the hand of the king. As we draw the curtains on yet another riveting episode, we've journeyed through the enigmatic realms of financial intrigue, where power and politics breed wealth and opulence, and a clandestine league navigated by the elite who walk in the corridors of deception. That was the man, the mystique and the enigma in the room, the biography of wealth and power from politics the hand of the king. This wouldn't have been possible without you. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the mysteries of financial universe. But I will constantly be yours. Jeff Kafka. <laughs>